we used the phrase at that time. We said, we want to be elite as a coaching staff before we're elite as a program. Every day, you know, our practice plans, our approach to the way we answered emails, our recruiting visits, we wanted those to be unbelievable back in 2013. And that we felt like if we could just win those days, day after day after day, day after day after day, eventually we'd be able to start cracking down on some of the larger goals. Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. On today's show, I get the pleasure of talking shop with Michael Deegan, head baseball coach for Denison University. In 2019, Denison shattered the record set the previous season by going 39-9 and advancing to another NCAA regional. The Big Red won a school record 17 straight games while capturing the program's first ever NCAC tournament championship. In seven seasons at Denison, Deegan has guided his teams to one NCAC tournament title, three West Division championships, and six appearances in the NCAC championship while posting a 653 winning percentage, which is also the tops in the 125 plus year history of Denison baseball. On the show, we talk about his new book titled, Let It Rip. And we also dive into how he shapes the vision, culture, relationship aspect on a daily basis, but also how he uses the first two weeks for the fall for leadership training. This episode is so good. And here is Michael Deegan. Mike, welcome to the show. Appreciate you having me, Jonathan. Absolutely. And you recently came out with a book, which I would like to talk about. And I have been a newsletter subscriber for, oh man, uh, I think a couple of years. And so I'm a a little bit familiar with you and I can't wait to dig in uh, a little bit deeper today. But for our listeners who'd like to get to know you a little bit better, can you give us a short snapshot about you and why you decided to get into coaching? Yes. uh, You know, so I I guess I had a little bit more of an untraditional approach. I, I wasn't someone who you know, new in college or, or, or younger that I wanted to get into coaching. Uh, right out of college, I got a job actually in sales with Coca-Cola Enterprises. So I started there and about a year in, I knew that that wasn't going to be my path. So I started taking classes at Duquesne University. And that's where I started looking at taking counseling education and then also trying to get in thinking about coaching all sports, really, basketball, baseball, football. And my idea was, Could you help young people get into college or get on their career path all the while teaching and coaching, which has always been just such a big part of my life. So from there, I was about a semester away from graduating uh, when the the job at Marietta College, assistant job came open, Mm -hmm. and I jumped and and took that pivot in my life and started coaching there without really knowing why. So your question of why did I get into coaching, I didn't really know why. I I just knew that I didn't like sales. Uh, I knew that I wanted to to make an impact uh, at some level. And then when I went to Marietta, I think I started learning a little bit more about myself. And I think the ultimate motivator was where I originally got started, was really just trying to help kids and and try to to make a difference in in people's lives. I love that. And again, I I, uh, am looking forward to reading your book. And I, I think that it's gotten really some good positive feedback over social media over the last couple of weeks. And I've been, again, a long a long time subscriber to your newsletter, which I think uh, you send out every every week or every couple of weeks. And with just some little, you know, head coaching nuggets, and and it's not just baseball, it's also different sports. And, and you're looking at all of that. And so I really, really enjoy that. And as far as, you know, what made you decide to write a book? And I, I know how hard writing can be because I've, I've tried to write some myself. And it's really, it's a really good practice, but it's really hard to do. And there's, there are days that, that I'm like, I don't even know why I'm doing this, but it really is good for self-reflection. But tell us a little bit about why you decided to write a book, and we'll get into what it's about. Sure. I, you know, for me, writing, I originally just started writing to, to clarify thoughts for myself. So, uh, you know, I guess it's been a long journey. But when I, when I was an assistant at Marietta, the first piece that I ever published 
was uh, a piece on, on toughness. Jay Billis, uh, the basketball analyst and former great player for Duke, he wrote a book, uh, sorry, wrote, a, wrote an article, and then it became a book on toughness for basketball and what true toughness was. And I wrote a baseball response to that. I think that was in 2011. So that's kind of where I first started. And then, you know, I just began writing and getting my thoughts in order and sharing those things. And I've started, as you, as you referenced, doing the, the weekly newsletter about five or six years ago. So it started there, and then it became, okay, well, why don't I try to turn something like that into a book? So I, to answer your question, I don't know why. Like, I don't have a big uh, a reason why the book. It wasn't something I've always wanted to do. It's just that on this path where I started sharing some of my thoughts and some of my feelings, I've attracted unique people into my life, and it's been such a, a great learning exchange. So what I've learned is by having the courage to put something out there, then you learn a lot in return. And so I did that through the newsletter, and then I'm just excited to see where the book takes it, you know, where, where sharing my thoughts mm-hmm. um, has allowed me to learn from some really great people. Well, and and you were gracious enough to send over, you know, just a quick overview of, of some different segments. And there was one that caught my eye just because we're all, we're, which is team formation. And I, I think that we are all, we're in, in, in the age of individualization, like hyper individualization. And we've got, you know, coaches who are always looking to better themselves and move up. We're looking for players who are doing the same thing. And I think that, you know, and this may be, you know, be, being on a soapbox a little bit, but I think the team aspect, you obviously get better if if everyone around us gets better. But I think some of that team aspect is and team formation is going a little bit by the wayside. And so I, I'm really curious on your thoughts on that and how to how to develop a high performing team, uh, because again, the most talented teams are rarely, you know, the ones who always win it all, right? Or or are sure. rarely the ones who win it all. And it, it, you know, it, it comes down to a lot of different factors, but as far as team formation goes, you've had success and you've had success doing this. So tell us a little bit about what team, you know, and you can go into the book too with this, but tell us a little bit about team formation, you know, what you found that is important and how we can make a cohesive team rather than just a bunch of individuals. So, uh, you know, I, I always say it, and I, and I mean this, I, I, I'm not, I'm not overly intelligent. I, I you know, I, I, I struggle with a lot of things, but the one thing I think I've been able to do over my life is surround myself with really good people and put myself in, in, in environments that allow you to thrive and are curious and allow you to learn and grow. And to me, that's what team formation is. And one of the first things I share in the, in the, in that segment of the book is about my life lessons learned playing pickup basketball. And, and I think you can learn a lot about team formation just by, if you go back to your days of playing basketball on the playground, like that's what team formation is all about. Like it wasn't about how many points you could score or, um, you know, or picking your best friend to play on that team because, you know, on, on certain days where I grew up, it, you know, there were, there was a weight to, to get on the court. And if you lost winners stayed, right. So if you lost, you're out. And so you had to choose your team wisely. It didn't really, like I said, it didn't matter who scored or when they scored or, you know, it was about how can we, be successful as a unit. And I think if we can break it down that simply into just about everything we do, whether that's a business or whether that's coaching a team is, you mm-hmm. know, can we get a bunch of selfless people that, that want to want us to succeed? And so I use that pickup basketball analogy because that was everything to me. I mean, that was, that's where you learn toughness. That's where you learn um, how to be selfless and how to do anything you can to create value to make your team successful. So to me, it's all teams, man. You know, you, as an individual, you can only do so much, but as a team, you can, you can do a lot. And that's where I really focus my time and energy is trying to create really effective, high performing teams. Well, we'll get back into that here in just a minute. I'm really looking forward into digging into how you're doing that at Denison, but let's, let's talk about whenever you took over and this is uh, 2013. And so whenever you, whenever you decided to take the job, and whenever you're looking at just some of the different steps that you want to take. And so I, I'm imagining myself taking a head coaching job, let's say next week. And I, so I interviewed, I, I'm ready to go. And then I get there and I show up and I'm like, man, I have all of this list of things. And where do I start? 
Like what, what are the first things that I want to do? Uh, what does the vision look like? I'm, you obviously sold that in the interview and you had a passion for that and you had an idea, but what did that look like for you? And, and uh, you know, we judge a president by their first 100 days or whatever. Yeah. And so what did you, kind of your first 100 days look like? Well, I would say the most effective thing we did early on was we did the hard work of, of evaluating all 420 at the time. There were 420 uh, Division three programs in the country. So we, we rolled up our sleeves, and, we, you know, and this was you know, a little bit subjective, uh, of course, but we ranked all the teams. And, and, I, and I wouldn't say we ranked them all 1 through 420. It was more we tried to put te- programs in buckets, basically. And by doing that process, we had to look and say it was very humbling, right? So, th- so this is where we are right now. And I think if, if that's kind of what I want to lead to, you know, if, if I were taking over a program right now, I would say what you have to do is strip away everything, take the emotion out of it, and decide where do you sit right now. And what we found out that is that at that time we were somewhere in the bottom 40% of the 423 teams in Division Three baseball. And when I say that, I don't mean that from a, it wasn't negative or positive. It's just, okay, this is where we are. There were a lot of great things going on at Denison in the baseball program that we could, that we could focus on, but there were some things we also had to just look at and go, okay, we're not, we're not that great of a program right now. Then the second part of that, I think you have to really identify where you want to go. You know, it's, it's creating clarity. And, and we, we use the phrase that clarity is king. So we decided that we wanted to try to be a, a, a national contender at an elite academic institution. And in order to do that, we felt that we started setting five and 10 year goals. So we felt in five years, could we be in the top 20%? And then in 10 years, could we be at a certain level? Um, so we started getting really clear. And then we could start sharing that. That becomes what we say is a shared vision of our program. So we talked about that at length. And then from there, Jonathan, it's, it's, it's rolling your sleeves up and just doing the hard work day in and day out. And, you know, we, we used the phrase that time. We said, we want to be elite as a coaching staff before we're elite as a program. So that. we, uh, every day, you know, our practice plans, our approach to the way we answered emails, our, our recruiting visits, we wanted to be, we wanted those to be unbelievable back in 2013. And that we felt like if we could just win those days, day after day after day, day after day after day, um, eventually we'd be able to start cracking down on some of the larger goals. But uh, if I were to give advice, it would be that, like identify where you are. Because if you don't know what the starting point is, it doesn't matter. And strip it away, get the ego out of it. Just where are you? Where do you want to go? And then start taking the massive action to start making things happen. Well, fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and let's jump, you know, to this last fall. And again, our listeners are listening in, in the wintertime. And, and so we're gearing up to start the new year and to start you know, spring practices and getting ready for the season. But what did this past fall look like? And what were some things you, you mentioned that you had some things that you identified early on that you wanted to attack. We're now six years in, what were the things that you guys identified this fall that you wanted to attack? Well, a, a fundamental, uh, you know, pillar of our program is a phrase called Kaizen, which means continuous and never ending improvement. And so that really drives our program. Um, you know, we, our fall, we really break down into two into two big things. First is competition, and and you you had mentioned that earlier um, that our game has pivoted quite a bit. You know, so you know, 20 years ago when I was when I was playing, um, you know, you it'd be hard pressed to find someone who had a hitting coach or a pitching coach. Um, you know, most of our where I grew up was was Legion baseball or Palomino. Um, you know, in that in that frame, so. Um, now it's just completely flipped almost. We, I don't know if we have one kid on our roster who hasn't had some kind of formal instruction. Um, I don't know of one kid on our team who hasn't went to some kind of recruiting showcase. So the game has changed a little bit where the young men we get now have, they're, they're light years ahead of, of, of where my generation was with knowing the mechanics of a swing or having, um, you know, certain things, uh, like that. They're, they're way ahead. Uh, but where they're behind, in our opinion, and where the gap lies is in how to play winning baseball, the competition factor. And so um, we try to focus a lot on just playing. So we play a lot in our fall. And, and by play, I just mean we just play baseball. And we all, you know, as a coaching staff, we're taking notes and we're, we're making sure that we're, you know, educating the guys on how to be more effective in trying to play winning baseball. So that's one layer where we've really – try to grow and enhance is in the player development piece. And, 
And when we say player development, we really like to start with the person development piece. So this has changed for us. We now, in the first two weeks, and we only get four weeks in the fall, Division mm-hmm. Three fall is really short. Sure. Uh, we do almost exclusively observation, listening and questioning, and data collection. That's it. Very little, if any, instruction. And you want to talk about frustrating for coaches and even for players. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, our charge is, you know, from me, starts with me is, guys, I don't want us instructing at this point. I don't want us because we want to get to know our guys. We want to get to know who they've worked with, what, what hitting philosophy they're coming to us with, what pitching philosophy they're coming with. Um, we want to know, you know, their history of competition and what it's been like for them to play at different levels. So we really go through that process. Then after two weeks, we bring the guys in we watch some video uh, we, we go over some of the data we've collected if, if necessary, and then we start trying to formulate a plan moving forward. Uh, so for us, the, the big change for us has been in how we approach person development and how that relates to player development. And also for us has been also diving more into the, into the data and some of the technology that's out there that can shrink the feedback loop all the while knowing that baseball is played with you by human beings with a heartbeat. And we need to honor that as well. So, really trying to blend those that art and that science because we've seen incredible uh, change and incredible positive growth in guys from both data and both from just human connection. So that's kind of what, where we focus on the fall. Sorry for the long winded answer, but it's competition and it's also person development. No, that's fantastic. And and let's, we can go ahead and hit on both of those things. And I, I just, I love the the level of detail and I love that by taking the first two weeks of that, you're telling them this is this is the number one thing that we're trying to do. And it's like, it, for for some reason, I, I think of base running. Uh, we all gripe about base running, but we do it at the end of practice whenever everybody's tired and we use it as conditioning, right? And so, uh, sure. it's, and it's the same thing. It's it's if you want to fit it in, which you do, and you're putting it at the very first of, of what you're doing this fall, whenever those guys are ready to go and whenever you're ready to go and you're saying, hey, let's let's pull back the curtain a little bit and let's get to know you guys a little bit better what makes you tick so we can learn the learner and we can help you more in the long run and 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 that way you don't have to you know drink from a fire hose while you're doing all of this stuff during practice and i am sure that was hard to to swallow at first but i'm sure you guys have reaped a ton of benefits but uh, if you don't mind go into some of the details uh, about your building the person i mean and, and building the culture building the environment i mean what what does that look like and what are some different things that we can steal from you well, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's, you know, esoteric or whatever. A lot of it is us just, um, you know, we've increased our individual meetings now. We, we now do six individual meetings a year. And one of those individual meetings is, is basically all questions where we just ask questions of the guys and, and where we're just trying to get to learn them, right? I, I, as coaches, our, most of us, myself, I'll speak for myself here, are default and to instruct and to, to show how much we know. And I think for us, we try to pause and observe, measure, collect, uh, listen. I think listening, I've said that a few times, but it's really listening in, trying to find out what motivates that, that student athlete. You know, I, I, you know we, we coach baseball for a living. That's what I do. Um, but we have young men who want to be doctors at Denison. So while I have this, you know, uh, big passion to, to push them and to try to get them to be as good of a baseball player as they can, well, someone may have an organic chemistry test this Thursday. That's really important to them. So um, that could be blocking some of their learning in baseball, and, and I need to respect that. So I think, once again, it's just, it's just having the humility to understand that we don't have all the answers and that we need to listen in and, and find out what, um, the, the personal drivers of, for our, that, that our players have. I think that's one of our main jobs. All the while, this isn't you know, soft or trying to minimize our ultimate shared vision of trying to compete on a national level. Um, so I think all those things are what we do trying to, to learn our guys. Now, from a culture, I mean, we really believe our culture is our competitive advantage. So we're constantly mas- massaging it, trying to grow it, trying to nurture that that piece. But I think a lot of it, it's not really forced. It's not like team building exercises. It's just paying very close attention to what we're doing every day. I love that. And I, I don't think that, that there's really a system that, that even if you gave us the outline of what 
you do on a daily basis, I think that would that would be and ring more more clear, ring true uh, in uh, in any circumstances that we're in and any programs that we're in and and you could give us the template, but we would all have to curtail it to who we're dealing with on a day, daily basis, what our time constraints are, and facilities and things like that. But as you just mentioned, I think that 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 is something that is something that we can steal from you for sure. And you also talked about integrating competition and competing and everything you do. You don't want to be the loser. You don't want to be sitting out watching everybody else play pickup basketball. But sure. uh, w- what are some different things that you guys do? It can either be in the fall or it can be in the spring, either one. But what are some of your favorite competitions that, again, that we can steal from you? Well, I, I you know, I, I, a lot of them are just, you know, we, we I mentioned earlier, and we want to play baseball a lot, just, just playing baseball. I think there's, there's sometimes a push for um, ways to manipulate our game. I, I, our game is also beautiful in, in itself. So just a, a straight up scrimmage is, is an opportunity to compete, right? So there's, there's just at that level, there's just playing baseball. You know, we do a lot of situational scrimmages where, you know, we, we have a, a scoring system in line where, you know, they get a point if, if they, they advance a runner from second to third or, um, you know, score a guy from third with less than two outs, those types of things. So we'll do, we'll create some situations. We do bunch scrimmages uh, where we, uh, once again, we do a nine inning bunch scrimmage where we put, you know, different scenarios involved, runner on first, runner on first and second, nobody out, you know, play three outs and switch. Uh, we do ground ball scrimmages. We're really trying to work on our guys, just, uh, you know, just trying to field ground balls in pressure situations with guys going up the line at, you know, four, four below where we're trying to put heat on our infielders. And then finally, I would say, you know, when we think about competition, it, it's, it's obviously me versus you, but the biggest competition that we really try to focus on, focus on is me versus me. And so I, I don't want to, to, to shortchange that. Uh, most of our competition re- revolves around uh, as an individual, every one of us, myself included, getting better on a daily basis. So we, we frame competition in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and I don't want to minimize the fact that for the most part, it's just this internal battle that I improve today. Oh, fantastic. And, and again, we're, you're not sacrificing the individual improvement because you're helping each of those guys get better within the team setting. And I think that, the, that that's always a great balance to have because if the players get a whole lot better, then the team's going to get a whole lot better, especially if you're putting them into situations uh, within the team that they can compete with each other and against each other and against other groups. And, and I love that. And, and so, uh, let's talk about your personal process and, and something that, that I've tried to get better at is talking about, you know, things outside of baseball and taking, taking small moments throughout the day to just ask them questions that have nothing to do with, with, you know, the game that we all love and taking more of a personal approach and you're recruiting these guys and you're getting to see them on campus. But is there, do you have any advice for the coaches who are looking to do something similar and just to get better at that? You know, we're, we're in the, we're in the stage of the year that we're all making new year's resolutions. And I think that the better we get to know the players, the better we know what, what makes them tick and how we can motivate them to get better and how we can hold them accountable. But is there a way that that you do that? And just give us some tips if you don't mind. Yeah, for us, you know, I, I think we have, you know, there's, you know, I mentioned the first part for us is, is the meetings, the the one on ones, and and you got to get the one on ones right. I, I don't, I don't think you can just, you know, say, hey, you know, we have this 15 minute block that we're gonna we're gonna talk to to, to Mike today. We can't do that. You know, we have to think about what we want to accomplish. So we set goals with those meetings um, of what we're trying to get out of uh, out of that meeting, and, and a lot of it is just getting to know our guys a little bit better. Uh, but you know, we we talk a lot for us about about trading, trying to create a culture of coaching, and so for us, it starts with number one, just um, having some clarity, making sure the guys know the the ultimate mission of our program, and then you know, are the pillars of our program, what what we're all about, and then we we kind of build on up and make sure they have that we uh, that they understand that we need to have a positive relationship with feedback, that feedback is going to come their way, um, so we 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 don't leave that to chance. I think that feedback, and I have a son now who's 10, he's our oldest, and we have three daughters, Mm -hmm. and the feedback that they get, even for my son who's 10 now, is much different than what what I received when I was 10, meaning it's it's much more encouraging, you know, it's much more positive, and I'm not not really trying to throw a judgment there, but a lot of times 
we have found that when we correct at this level, it's almost seen in a negative light. If that makes sense, like if you if you just say, hey, let's let's try to do something differently, that can be seen as almost like picking. Mm-hmm. And so we we talk about how feedback is is important, you know, and, and in order for them to grow and improve, they're going to need to receive feedback. Now, Jonathan, I think on the big end of that, on the other end of that, as as a coach, I've got to be ready to receive feedback as well. Sure. You know, this past year, we sent out a we sent out a questionnaire for our hitters, and uh, one young man in there basically said he got worse last year, and which is never what a coach wants to hear, right? That's and and I had my thoughts on it. And what's what do you think my first reaction to that was? What, what did you think from me, like when I heard him talk negatively about our hitting program? What do you think my reaction was? Oh, I just I think that it would be a normal reaction of getting defensive about why he's wrong. Yes, exactly. So exactly. So right right away, I wanted to call him in and say, "Hey, you didn't do this, 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 and this. You didn't buy in. You didn't." Right. But instead, I had to go. You know what? I, I want to thank you for that feedback. I really appreciate you having the courage to to open up to us about some of the things that we're doing. And I can't promise you that it's going to change, but I can promise you that I'll look into it. And because I, I can make that promise. Um, you know, I can promise to look into it and, and we can pivot if necessary. But so we start with feedback and then we move up on the ladder of building trust um, and, and trust. We, we use the, the motto of, of character, competency and connection. Those three things, um, listening and questioning. And then finally, we, we get into where we're, we're trying to develop them as players. So mm-hmm. if I probably, you know, I, I do I have it in my mind that kind of that scaffolding effect of, you know, clarity, then feedback, then trust then listening and questioning, and then finally we're going to get to where we're developing the player all under the umbrella of the shared vision of trying to win a national championship. Right, and you know, a lot of this stuff goes back to, I think it was, it's the Bruce Lee quote that he talks about, uh, whenever you need a teacher, he'll be there, right? Mm-hmm. And, and unless they're ready to receive the feedback, then it it, it doesn't matter. And, that, and that's something that, that I've really had to learn as a coach because, you know, when you're young, you see, you know, all of these different things. And it's, it's one of those that it's really hard to find that balance and to let them fail uh, for a long enough time to where they're open to what you have to say too. And, and, and that's something that, that whenever that happens, you as a coach need to be ready too. And, you know, I, I was listening to a podcast actually today, it was Nick nurse with the Raptors and, and he mentioned, you know, love and accountability and he, and he talked about, you know, uh, not to go too far off topic, but he yeah. talked about whenever he got the job, he had to sell the players on what he knew, but that was very, that was very little of his actual job title. And so he, he said that the players have to understand what you, that you know your stuff and that you're going to help them get, get to where you want to go. And he said that once, once they understood that, then, then we had them. Right. And then yeah. they understood that, that they, that I need to get to know them. I need to know my stuff. And I need to be uh, looking out for their best interests. And I, I thought that was really good. But he talked about that being a very small part of what he actually had to do over the last couple of years. And and he's he's coaching in many many different aspects of of uh, basketball and overseas and, and and like very small schools in Iowa. But that that just reminded me of that because I thought that that was really good. And so you also you're, since you're the head of the program you also have assistants that work for you and work with you sure. on a daily basis. And, you know, me as an assistant, I, I've always been driven to look down the road and go, man, I, I want to be a head coach someday. And I think that's, you know, that's that's a, a vision that most assistants have uh, at some point in their careers. And so as a head coach, uh, how do you prepare those guys for that moment? Uh, is, is it something that you do intentionally or is it is it more of the, hey, I'm going to show them what I've been able to do that that we've been successful with. I'm going to have conversations with them or just what's your process with developing those guys to be ready if that time comes for them? Yeah, I, th- I think for us, it's just, it's uh, it's exposing them to, to everything they possibly can be exposed to, right? That's that's kind of you know as I've as I've kind of moved on in my leadership journey, I really feel like my job is to put our coaches in a position where they can use their strengths and then flourish. So like my job really is to is to set the culture to keep us kind of moving in the right direction. Where on a daily basis, um, you know, the, you know, particularly for me, it's Ryan Romick. I mean, my my main my top assistant, my full time assistant. Um, he's the, he's kind of the, the, the heartbeat of the, of the program day in and day out. So, uh, you know, his, his job is, is really running the day to day. And then my job maybe is to, is to make sure that, you know, I'm kind of guiding this program 
in the direction that that the un, that, that's in in congruence with the the university that's in agreement with the philosophies there and then also with the philosophies of our program so i mean ryan ryan runs this thing i mean he's 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 as ready to be a head coach as, as anybody right now in the country probably i think just because day in and day out he's ha- he has so much responsibility oh fantastic i, I love that and I, I again there are so many of these questions that i ask because there are questions that you can't see just by coming to one or two practices it's stuff that that it's a living breathing thing that happens on a daily basis and that's why that's why i love being able to run the show because that's the stuff that i want to be able to to get a look into yeah. and, and you've done such an eloquent job of explaining that which it's not easy to do uh, another thing that that we don't really get to see a ton of and that's either you know people post standards on walls uh, at times and and you could probably walk walk through Alabama's football locker room and see so many different slogans and different things like that uh, and I'm sure the process is <laughs> is posted literally like everywhere right. in that entire place but but anyway so so what are some different standards that you guys have and I, I mean I I am really getting into okay we have these standards but also how do we hold them accountable for that? Uh, how do what was the process and and us coming up with that and we all have to make them them their own they all have to be part of our ownership of our program together but what was your process in coming up with those and then you know what are they uh, and just take us through that a little bit so for us I, you know I, I don't think we have a ton of rules like I, I I've thought I've thought back on this I, I had someone ask me this question a couple of years ago and you know we we my first year we had a you know we had a typical playbook and the, and the first thing was the the rules and you had you know all these different things listed out um now the the pillars of our program really guide us and and there's four things that we talk a lot about and that's the first one is grit and we define grit as physical and mental toughness and the ability to persevere and overcome obstacles the second is gratitude and we define gratitude as a readiness to show appreciation and the opposite of gratitude is, is entitlement and we want to avoid that we want to Make sure that we're we're thankful for everything and, and entitled to nothing. So, that's those, those two things are our first two, and then the last two are our babies, Kaizen, which I mentioned earlier, which is continuous improvement. You know, we've we've set back to back records for for wins in our school and won the first conference tournament and done all kinds of stuff. And and in our eyes, we still have so much further to go. Like we're we're not even we're just scratching the surface on where we need to be. So, continuous growth, and then then Mudita. Uh, the phrase that that we just love is is a is a it means vicarious joys. Can I be happy for another success as if it's my own? So those are our four pillars of our program, and really those guide just about everything we do. So when when you know we deal with eighteen to twenty two year olds, and they're they, they're going to make mistakes. Uh, they they and they're going to make a lot of mistakes, and they're usually in violation of one of those four things. So we hold them accountable. We have we have the discussions and. And we do things that are necessary to hold them accountable. And then we move on. You know, I think that's it. I mean, we're, we're here to teach and learn. Mm-hmm. And, and if every 18 to 22 year old who ever made a mistake was, you know, was released or kicked off the team or whatever, I, I just don't think that's the best way to educate. So, but we do, we hold them accountable and then we, then we move on with love and, and, uh, and encourage them to make some necessary changes that are going to help them in the long run. No, and I, I was listening to. Sorry, I, I keep hopping in on these, thinking of of whenever whenever I listen to people speak or whenever I'm reading articles, I'm always trying to relate it back to something that I re, I've really liked in the past. And that I was listening to a podcast. I, I think it was Brett McCabe's. Uh, I know it was with Patrick Murphy, the the softball coach at uh, the University of Alabama. Fantastic. He's individual. a guru. He's a guru yeah, in Medina, about it. I, I love I love listening to him speak and and he's a, he listens to the podcast so shout out to him and and great great person but he talked about that too and he talked about that he gets on to his players and then he would have the younger players you know they they had ne- probably never had that and so they were asking the older players what what to do like what do I do the next day do I just kind of walk on eggshells do I let him come to me and they would all tell them that it'll be a new day don't worry about it. Like he'll forget about it. And that's something that really stuck out to me because I, I feel, you know, I feel like I can do that sometimes, but probably not enough. I, I, I need to be able to for, just forgive and forget and move on just like I would want that grace if, uh, if somebody got on to me about something that I was doing. And so that I love hearing that. And, and I love that, you know, success does leave clues. And obviously both of you guys have been successful in, in different, different sports at different levels. But if you guys He's are saying met- it, 
If you guys are saying, he, I'm he's listening. a mentor of mine. I appreciate. He's a mentor of mine. He actually came here and and spoke to our team and spent a day with me. I, I teach a class. And he he mm-hmm. spoke at our to our class this year and just a just a humble, you know, just a special special person who's who's meant a lot to me. So I think the parallels are probably from the teaching that he's done to me, you know, over the, over the years. So I appreciate oh, you mentioning Murphy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so uh, let's go ahead and skip to the spring. We're, again, at the time of, of recording and listening to this, we're about to start ramping up our uh, spring practices and, and getting, you know, wiping the dust off of last year's practice plans and seeing what we can do better. But take us through, once once we get going, and take us through a typical practice of, of what a practice plan would look like, you know, during the season. Uh, it, it, this is such a hard question to ask because we all have such different schedules and you guys sure. play are playing on certain days uh, in Oklahoma. They play almost every day in Texas. We played two days a week. And so it's so hard yeah. to be able to set that up. But if you were just, if you're, if a coach was going to ask, Hey, can you give us a couple practice plans, you know, of, of what a typical day looks like, what would that be? What have you guys decided to devote more time to less time to, and, and just kind of walk us through it a little bit. Well, you, you nailed it, right? Like you nailed it in your question. I mean, it's, Training sessions are just going to vary so greatly for us, whether time of year, team or individual, or inside or outside. So they're going to vary quite a bit. You know, standard practice for us, standard outside practice for us, a team in a team setting, where we we would start with some kind of of, of catch play, you know, positional catch play with task involved. So our, our catch play is an opportunity that kind of that kind of starts our practice. That kind of starts the 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 focus and the intent because. Yeah, and I can't say because on some days we are just going to go out and get our arms loose, but for the most part, we're we're doing tasks. Our infielders are, you know, working their double play feeds, or working on their relays. You know, um, catchers are working on their exchanges, etc. So there's going to be some kind of task involved with our catch play. Um, then we move on to unit specific defensive work. Um, you know, where our infielders would be doing something. Uh, outfielders are going to be doing some work. Uh, catchers. And then we would probably bring them all back together and try to try to merge them. So we start with a small part, then we then we work on the whole part. So for example, we may be working on, you know, our relays um, and deflections for our infielders. And so during their individual during their unit segment, they're probably working on that in some capacity. Where our outfielders are working on, you know, throwing to the cuts in their individual setting. And while our catchers may be working on tags and calls at the plate during their their unit breakdown, and then we bring them all back together and we work on cuts and relays as a group. So some kind of segment like that. Then we move into our, our, our batting practice and we, you know, we call our batting practice a defensive BP because we log put outs, assist errors, dives, and web gems. So we would do some kind of batting practice and then we follow it up with some kind of scrimmage of some sort. Um, and that scrimmage could be at anything from a, a situational scrimmage, which we described earlier, a bunch scrimmage, ground ball scrimmage, some kind of competition form at the end. So that would be a typical day. I love it. And so uh, another thing that I really, I, again, I, I love to see inside your program, as far as BP goes, what, what does that setup look like for you? And uh, I, again, unless we're there every day, it probably changes from time to time. But uh, I, I love getting to see what, what other people, how they set up their BP and, and what they're choosing on working on. So what does that look like? Well, our, our BP setup, we, um, you know, we usually have five groups going typically, you know, depending on what day it would be. So the guys on the field, you know, they're going to be working through some kind of routine. Sometimes we're going to put task involved there, like meaning we're going to challenge them up in some capacity. Sometimes it's going to be a feel good BP for that, for that group on the field. So, I, you know, I think there's a, um, there's a, there's a push now to make batting practice more challenging. I believe in that for sure. But I also think if if you interview enough guys who play at the highest level, there is something about just the feel goods of taking a good round of batting practice on the field that we're, that we're going to do on a, on a given day. We're going to have some. Uh, we're going to have a group base running. That's that's going to have you know task involved and and a, and a plan there as well. It could be just working on going first to third. It could be reading down angles at third base. Mm-hmm. It could be the mechanics at second base. Fly ball in the air with no outs. What are we doing? Fly ball in the air with one out. What are we doing? Um, those types of things from our base runners. We're going to have two groups that'll be on the field uh, playing playing defense. That's where what I described. Where we're going to where we're going to be logging the the putouts, dives, assists, web gems. You know, we're going to we're going to in airs, 
uh, in that capacity. So they're going to, and we, and we have a defensive MV, MVP most days. So there's an accountability aspect there. And then we'll have one group in our batting cages or, or our batting range where they're going to be working on just, just some drills and things like that. Uh, once again, sometimes it's drill work. Sometimes it's just, they're just in there, um, you know, getting the feel goods going a little bit. So, um, we have the five stations. We try to move pretty efficiently and, mm-hmm. and, um, try to get a lot of, a lot of work in, in that time frame. Oh, fantastic. Uh, with whenever you're talking about the season, I, I think that some of the, some of something that I had tried to get better at the last couple of years was making sure that I spoke with the guys who didn't play every day because, or yeah. maybe might not even be, be in our position group. And I know as a head coach, that's something come so just some positive words of affirmation coming from you could make a player's week and uh and so any any time that there are individuals who are negative they're going to bring other guys with them and so i felt like that was an area of importance and and something that you know you listen to to guys who were you know back back in my day we didn't have to have those conversations they didn't do this this or that but i think today cohesively i think that that's a really really big thing because again they want to play and we want to put the best team on the field, and sometimes those two things don't necessarily mesh. But uh, have you had to have conversations like that, or, or what's what's your process with that? I mean, I I think some of the hardest coaching we have to do is the one on one meeting about you know playing time or how this person can get better, or after the season maybe they didn't play a whole lot and trying to be encouraging but also tell the truth. And you sound like a guy who would do that really well. And I don't know if you would say that about yourself, but getting to know you a little bit better, uh, you know, just through text and, and during this conversation, I, I feel like you would, you would do that w- really well. So can you take, can you give us a peek into what something like that would look like? No, you know, I appreciate you saying that. And I, and I don't, I don't know if I do it well. I, I don't, I don't know. That. I don't know. If I, and just being in full transparency, I don't know if our guys would think that I struggle. I, I struggle. I struggle. The, the, the biggest challenge for me is this internal dilemma of what you just described there is that inherent Mm -hmm. uh, wrestling match between wanting everyone to be happy and also knowing that's never going to happen, right? That's just not going to happen. So for me, I always call on the shared vision of the program. And that that for us, that starts in the recruiting practice process. Sorry, the recruiting process. It starts in in every meeting we have, where we talk about the the overall, all overall, arching goal of the program is to win a national championship. And my job is to try to find the guys that, that can help us do that. So it starts there. Um, I, it, it upsets me when guys are upset. It really does. But what we try to focus on is that their job is to try to improve and get better. So one of the pillars like we've talked about is continuous improvement. So regardless if you're in the lineup that night or not, you can get better. And, you know, I've always said that the three hitter, the freshman that plays shortstop and bats third doesn't need me a whole lot. The guy who's not playing and hurting probably does. Mm. Now you, you meet them everywhere though, right? Some guys that also mean that some guys don't want to hear from me right now. They don't, you know, they're, they're upset with sure. me. That makes sense. Right. They're upset. They're upset. So the assistant coaches, that's where they can be. They can do a great job there of kind of buffering that, but their focus, especially when as underclassmen has to be, just keep getting better, keep getting better. You know, we, we say in our program, like there's, there's different places. Like I, one of the pet peeves of mine as a small school coach is, you know, we'll hear from a coach that that's representing a kid. They'll say, Hey, he, you know, he's getting some division, small division one looks, but I want him to come to your place. Cause I, cause I don't want him to go and sit, right. I don't want him to go and sit. I want him to go where he can play. I'm like, man, don't, don't come here and don't come here. Cause that's not why you come here. Like that's, that's not why you would do it. Like you, right. you do it for this pursuit of excellence. You do it for this growth, do not do it to play right away because that's you're setting yourself up for failure. So anyways, I, I don't know if I do a great job. I, you know, we try to just make sure everyone in our program knows how important they are, like whether they're keeping a chart or whether it's, it's being a great practice player. Um, but I, maybe I could do a better job with those one-on-ones, but I also know that some guys don't want it at that point either. They just want to go about their business. So it's a wrestling match. I think almost every coach has. No. And I love that you, I think that that's the job of the assistant coach as well to to be able to to notice those things and again they're they're they'll get to hear some of that stuff before you will just because they they see yeah. you and they see you right and sometimes you have to be the bad guy and so the assistant coaches have you know might need to be the good guy in that situation and so again sure. it, it's always hard and it's it's always a balancing act 
sure, we're going to get feedback from every one of our coaches, but I'm the one that ultimately has to write the lineup in, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the, that's where the, the, the anger or whatever may get directed. Uh, and I shouldn't even say anger because that's not, that's not usually the case, but it's maybe the frustration or, or, or whatever. But mm-hmm. um, I also think this is just kind of another, another thought. The older you get, the more you, you do some self-discovery, you know your weaknesses. And one of my weaknesses is that I, that I do. I want everyone to be happy. And sometimes for me, I have to keep, um, I don't, I hate to even say it, but I have to keep a certain distance in order to make the decision that I think is best for our program, you know? Sure. And so if I get too overly involved with certain things that may cloud my judgment. So in order for me to most effectively do my job, I sometimes have to call on the assistant coaches or a lot of times what I'll do is, is, is once again, I, I'm really transparent with our players and I'll tell our leadership group, guys, I struggle with this. I really struggle. And I know there's some, some guys who are upset that aren't playing right now. You need to be there for them. Help them out. Pick them up. I'm going to do the same, but it's going to mean a lot from you as well. So I, I think it's a shared responsibility for us to, to encourage all those people. Sure. No, absolutely. And so let, let's get to know you a little bit better with some quick hitters. And yeah. uh, again, you're, you just wrote a book, which is fantastic, but you're also learning – uh, and you have self-admitted that you that you don't know everything yet, and you're learning on a daily basis. But what's something that that has excited you lately that you've learned? Uh, I, my obsession right now is on um, I would say anything with human performance, uh, leadership, and culture, and then coaching development. And so I, I really look just about anywhere and everywhere for for those topics. And so I I can't really give you like an exact nugget that I've learned, mm-hmm. but really my focus is on just try, how, how can we create the best learning environment possible for our for our players is where m- most of my attention is going and 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 i feel like i've made some good ground on that in the last couple two or three weeks anything specific that we should be digging into if we were interested in those topics i i think just the, the importance of your language and 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 how you cue uh, you know i always say that, that we have we have an abundance of praise in our society so there's a lot of that boys good job way to go way to go uh, but not as much affirmations Mm-hmm. An affirmation is where you transfer your comment almost to where the 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 athlete believes it themselves, right? So it's not just me filling the air with that boys. It's me trying to find ways to say, my goodness, like your decision making right now seems phenomenal. So what what's that been like? What what has made you so effective in your decision making lately? And then have them explain it. That's much better than me saying, hey, way to go. So. Just how we use our language is something that I think is really, really powerful and trying to be intentional about um, the questions we ask and the way we approach those interactions are really important. I love that. And and that's something that I think is truly valuable. Next question is, what is something that you guys do in practice that your players love? Uh, Let's say that you showed up tomorrow and they saw in the practice plan that they were doing this. They got really excited. What is that? I'm going to be really short here. I don't know that answer, and I'm not sure I care. Um, I, okay. I, I just, you know, we, our we're, our job is that we, we we try to get better every day. And so the guys in our program who who love to get better love the fact that we're trying to put a product out there every day that's that's challenging and tough. So I don't know if there's anything they particularly love. I think they love the idea of uh, the fact that we're we're going to get better today. So I don't mean to punt that question, but. I've really thought about what what they love in our practice setting that much. Okay. Well, what is uh, the next question? Is a tough one. Uh, I think that it, it's something that we all have biases, and you know, we coach for long enough to where we see certain trends, and it may or may not agree with analytics or other coaches. So, what is something that you believe that other coaches may, let's say, have a nice discussion about with you? Man, good question. I, I would say, all right, here here you go. I enjoy listening and learning from, from guys like John Smoltz mm-hmm. and Kevin Euclid and, and some of these guys that, that have played the game at such a high level that a lot of people don't agree with what they say on broadcast because it goes against some of the new school stuff. And, and I say that because I don't, I don't necessarily always agree with, with those guys and what they say. Um, but my goodness, anyone who's played – at the big league level and they've been on that journey and they've had the success that they've had. I want to pull up a seat and listen and really, really listen. You know, I, I think that they get dismissed as, 
being, you know, old school or crusty or whatever. But man, if anybody has had the, the success that they had in the big league level, I want to, I want to listen in, you know, a couple other things would be just, you know, we, we believe in, and playing to win and not that that most coaches also believe in that, but we'll bunt, we'll do whatever we need to do to try to win the game in front of us. Um, and so uh, I know some of that, that stuff kind of takes a, a backseat on social media. Uh, but, you know, we still believe that, that, you know, this is a game and it's a competition. And so what is, what do we do? Well, what does the opposition do poorly and what can we do to try to help win that game? Whatever that may be right within the rules and, by doing it with integrity. So I know there's, there's a, you know, social media buzz where a lot of that stuff is seen as bad and, and I, I don't see it that way. And I don't want to make myself sound, um, you know, too old school because we, <laughs> you know, we, we believe in data and technology and sure. a lot of things, a lot of the new wave training, but I guess it's my way of saying that I, I want to pay homage to the past, whether it's listening to guys that played in the bigs or, you know, just doing, you know, things that are necessary to win games. Well, it sounds like you're just trying not to ride the pendulum swings that happen on social media and sensationalism. Great word. That's exactly right. So if we came to a practice of yours tomorrow and uh, we sat, sat in the stands the whole practice, what do you think that, that, that we would notice? What would be you know three things that may stand out or three things that you hope that we would take away from watching one of your practices? Whew. Well, I, I would say... You know, as a as a program, we've we've committed to not being obsessed with external validation, whether that's wins and losses or rankings or you know accolades. And more, we're more motivated by internal success. And so, I'm I'm going to get to your answer, but I, we we define four things that we that we define for us that success. And 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 the first is our relationships. The second is is preparedness. The third is respect, and the fourth is competition. So I would hope if you came to our practice, whatever we were doing that day, and we talked about it, it just varies day to day. And But I would hope you would see and feel our relationships. I, I hope you would see a lot of high fives and a lot of smiles and a lot of um, of enjoyment going on in our practice, some some relationships, um, not necessarily anything formal, but just I just hope that would be a takeaway of yours. The second, I, I hope you would see a high-level of, of preparation. I think your, your eyes, and I don't necessarily mean that would be just be the most efficient practice you ever saw or Mm -hmm. the most highly detailed, because sometimes our game, let's face it, is inefficient and is time consuming. So you may see a practice that has some standing around. I I would, on a given day, because we may be trying to create that, that, that environment, but I, whatever you would see that day, I hope you would see it and an intentionalness to it. uh, And that we were very, very prepared for the day. Respect would be just respect for each other, respect from player to player, from coach to player, from the, the respect of our physical facility, meaning how we picked up and, and put away our equipment and the way we took care of things. I hope you would see a level of respect. And then finally, I would see, say that, you know, ultimately we're, we're, we're in competition. And so whether that's me versus you or me versus me, there would be some kind of, of, of focus because competition is going to bring out a certain drive and a certain attention to detail. That's just not going to be there without it. So uh, those four things, regardless of what we were doing, I hope you'd be able to sit back and go, um, yeah, they, they won the day as far as how they how they determined success. Oh, I love that. I've got two more questions for you. The basic resource question is, you know, what, what are some different things that, that have changed your coach's, you know, coaching career? You mentioned that you're really into coaching development and culture and environment and some other things earlier, but can you give us some, you know, some, some resources to look for if, uh, that could help change our coaching career? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I think it's just being open, first of all, to anything and everything. I mean, I've, I've had some favorite books. My favorite book is a book called the alchemist by Paulo Coelho, <clears throat> sorry, by Paulo Coelho. Um, our, our team right now is reading, um, our freshmen are reading, uh, a, a John Gordon book, called training camp. Our sophomores are reading another John Gordon book called the energy bus. Juniors are reading chop wood, carry water by Joshua Metcalf. And our seniors are reading legacy by James Kerr. So those are some of the books that, that I've enjoyed over the years that are pretty easy reads that have really good uh, messages. Uh, and then for me, I just, it's anything I can consume and it's almost, it's, it's, it's an obsession. I mean, podcasts, um, you know, just different newsletters, Twitter, 
I, I love Twitter. I know Twitter can have some bad content on there, but I, I find myself finding articles that, that other people have liked and shared that have made a big difference for me. But I think it's just that, that constant curiosity and wanting to learn more and know more. And I think as long as you're working in your sweet spot, you'll find those things. Uh, meaning as long as you're on your path, you'll find those things that, that really fire you up and where you want to learn and grow. Fantastic. And final question, Do you did you make a New Year's resolution? And if so, what is it? You know, I, I didn't make a New Year's resolution, and, and, I, and, I, and I won't. Um, but I, I, I started this past month. I, I really want to make my, and I hate using eyes and my's, but I, I want to make my health and wellness a, a priority, you know, and and so um, I'm just committed. I, I don't. I, I try to. I try to make this commitment this last month, where there's some for a coach, there's a little bit more free time than normal um, to really start to start creating the habits and behaviors. Because I w- I'm glad I'm getting you. You asked that question because every time the season rolls around, I put it to the back burner. And and for some reason, you know, Urban Meyer, the former Ohio State football coach, could get a 30 minutes on the elliptical, and I can't. I don't know why I wouldn't, you know, so I want to make sure that I stay committed to my health and fitness because, you know, my family deserves it and our players deserve it. And if, and if I want to accomplish the things I want to accomplish in this lifetime, I'm going to need to, to be sharp. So um, that's what I, I, I started a month ago. I'm going to try to carry that right to the new year. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. If there are any listeners who are listening in the summer of 2020, make sure you check in with uh, Coach Deegan on Twitter. And if they wanted to, uh, what would be the easiest way to find you? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm pretty I'm somewhat active on Twitter, so got yeah, at coach at coach Deegan there. I do have a website with, that houses a, a lot of the newsletters that I've writ, written over the years. It's coachmikedeegan.com, and then the book that's out. It's called Let It Rip: My Life Lessons Learned Through Sports is is available on Amazon. So if you just search Mike Deegan, um, it comes up, and I'd appreciate you picking it up and and uh, staying in touch with me. Absolutely. Well, I will make sure that those get linked in the show notes and I'm going to open up the mic for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? No, I just, you know, anyone who's leading, anyone who's coaching, I just, I really appreciate all you do. I know it's a tough job at times and, and, uh, it's, it's great that, uh, we get to have a shared community where we get to express, um, the things that we struggle with and the areas that we want to grow and, and I just appreciate you all you do for, for our youth and for those you lead. So thank you so much, and thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.